All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Adam, Content Marketing Specialist with Henry Schein. On behalf of Henry Schein and Densply Serona, I'd like to thank you for attending today's online learning session. Both Henry Schein and Densply Serona are grateful to be able to offer this content virtually to help our customers with continuing education learning during this time. Before we get started, I would like to remind everyone that today's two-hour session is being recorded and you will have access to view it next week. We are not offering continuing education credits for attending this presentation live or viewing it after the fact. Throughout today's session, we encourage your participation via the Q&A feature. If you have a question for our panelists, please type it into the Q&A area. We will be monitoring questions throughout the two hours and we'll answer them live as we have time. I would like to thank Dr. Sam Bullwinkle for sharing his time and insights with us today, as well as his team for their technological contributions toward making today's online learning event possible. So with that, I'll throw it over to you, Dr. Bullwinkle. Uh, I'd love to introduce Doug. Uh, Clark here is with us as well. I'm Dr. Bullwinkle. Um, welcome, and, and we're excited to see you guys today. Well, yeah, see ourselves, but see you virtually. We're hoping to, hoping to get a lot of interaction from everybody today and talk a little bit about technology uh, in the dental office and the dental profession and what it's doing for our practices, for our patients. Um, we've got a lot to, to cover today. We're excited. Um, so we're going to get rolling. I know Doug's got a few things to, to intro as well. Real quick, just want to thank Henry Schein and Dent Supply Serona for sponsoring this event, making it all possible, bringing us all together tonight. I want to introduce, uh, we, in addition to Dr. Bullwinkle, we have two other experts that will join us tonight. Uh, Dr. Sharesh Sharkande uh, from Zephyr Sleep Technologies. He's the chief dental officer there. He's going to share his thoughts on implementing sleep into your practice using the simple sleep solution. And then up in Portland, Oregon, my friend Doug Fettig, dental CPA extraordinaire, good guy, good first name, bad taste in college football teams, is going to talk about the ROI and some tax implications uh, of making a purchase at this time. Um, we're going to do live patient work today. We're going to show you exactly our processes, how we utilize the Dent Supply Serona technology to maximize efficiencies, drive revenues, increase profits, whether you're just made a purchase or looking to make a purchase, I think you'll get a lot out of this and, and really enjoy the content. Um, and then last thing for me, usually we do these live and in person and, and we love interaction. Um, we demand it when people are here. There's, there's no choice but to talk and interact and get our hands on stuff. Tonight, we're obviously in the Zoom verse. So our version of that tonight will be using the Q&A and the chat uh, feature. I'll be here monitoring those questions. You can ask Dr. Bullwinkle. Uh, Doug, Sharesh, I'll get the, those questions filtered and, and get them answered live for you. We really want to make sure you get everything that you want out of this hour and a half to two hours of, of live patient work. So kick it back to Dr. Bullwinkle. We'll kind of go over a little more in depth of what you'll see when we get into the operatories, and then we'll go from there. Yeah, and, and let's just introduce a little bit of the concept of what we're doing. So we're talking about a live virtual expo. So we, we hold expos here for Densify Serona for, for Henry Schein where you as doctors can come and participate. And, and we demonstrate the technology live um, as we partner with, what's, uh, with a, a company called Infusion Foundation. It's a non-for-profit. We work with a couple of our local VA groups uh, to provide services that they normally can't get uh, in, in the community. So we provide implants, um, we provide crown and bridge, we provide airway opportunities. Um, so we use the technology, we're able to provide the service. And so today, we have one of our VAs with us as well that we placed some implants on earlier. Uh, we'll be kind of going through his case, but uh, this virtual side of things is gonna be a little bit different. So we're live, um, meaning that we want as much interaction as we can. Our patients live, we're gonna demonstrate some, some uh, post COVID uh, workflows uh, and demonstrate, I think one of the most uh, impressive things about technology right now, Doug, that I'm seeing in this environment is how it really does distance me a little bit from my patient. Mm -hmm. um, prior to COVID, it was, was more about efficiencies, really flexing the technology, doing more in less time, really kind of increasing uh, productivity and, and just um, really patient care uh, with the technology. Now we, we're coupling on um, the ability to do this type of, of treatment at the level that we can provide this type of care and still follow protocols that yeah. we didn't know were protocols was, prior to right. like, the onset of COVID. Yeah, that's always something you would have listed as a benefit of the technology, but it had been down here. And yeah, because it was three months. It's three months, it's, it's just catapulted. So let's, uh, let's jump ahead. We're gonna go through and look at uh, the how, the why, 
uh, about uh, driving revenue uh, in, in our front doors. Um, I know Doug uh, Fettig, when he jumps on, we talk, he talks a lot about how we cannot cost cut our way to prosperity. Um, and so investing in technology, investing in workflows, investing in new revenue streams. If you're not doing implants, how do you introduce implants? If you're not doing ortho, introduce ortho, introduce airway. Um, be able to provide services for your patients and care that they normally would have to go out of the office, receive especially multiple visits, get multiple exposures out in the community, keep them there in your office and provide care that's just unmatched. But to do that, it takes a little bit of work. It takes a little bit of investment. It's understanding uh, models of being able to implement uh, systems. And I think that's the biggest thing is being able to implement, implement systems. So we're going to talk today a little bit about uh, the 3D infusion power block. And this will be being able to use the application of technology to produce $10,000 in two hours. So understanding how to calibrate your team, have a team that's trained and, and, and calibrated to, to use the technology so that you can produce in two hours what most dentists take a day, day and a half worth of production to do. And that allows you then to work with your patients, spend more time with your patients, uh, and cultivate a better relationship. Yeah, I think it's, it's worth noting right now the teams at work. Right. Utilizing. Yeah. Them. Yeah. So we've started. Yeah. So the power box already started. And I'm going to, and I just got the power box slide in front of you. It's a little bit grainy. Um, it's a little bit uh, um, uh, uh, fuzzy, but kind of look at just the headline here. We're talking about $10,000 in two hours. Today, we're going to split that power block up. We're going to do it in two, two opportunities. We're going to see um, airway. We're going to see implant restore today. Uh, we're going to see two implant restores on our patient, James. And then we're going to uh, demonstrate the airway model and being able to do, uh, introduce sleep dentistry, uh, understand that process, and be able to actually uh, fabricate a digital, uh, the digital a application for sending a device, a DME, uh, to a lab to get back to your patient. So we're talking about the production side of the technology and packing that into a real power packed uh, uh, program. So as we look at the PowerPoint or as, as the power block today, the team's already started. And this is one thing I love about technology. A little bit of history about me. I introduced CEREC to my practice about 10 years ago, 12 years ago. I can't remember anymore. Um, but uh, it was Blue Cam and it went to OmniCam. And then we start, I started noticing in my practice, I needed more technology. I needed a solution. I didn't just need technology. So we introduced a second OmniCam and a third OmniCam. And we were running three OmniCams, uh, three mil units and two, two to three ovens to walk through just the patient load that I had. So it was a solution. I was introduced to 3D. And that took me to the next level. Um, we talk about cone beam. We talk about technology in the dental practice. And, and literally right now, there is no way I would practice dentistry without a couple of things. And number one, it's a cone beam. Uh, once, I, now that I've been introduced to that technology, 3D imaging, there's, there's just not a chance that I would ever step into practicing in any environment without that technology in place. It helps me diagnose. It drives revenue. It's the genesis of being able to add implant. It's the genesis for adding ortho, adding airway. Those modalities that drive revenue and provide a patient experience unmatched by any other process that I've seen all stems from a cone beam. And then everything else is just kind of circles around it. Um, and then my team circles around that. So that cone beam is such a valuable tool uh, to, to have in our, in our armamentarium. So we talk about success in the dental practice. What do you see as success? Doug? What, as, you, as you've been exposed to dentistry for 15, 18 years. Yeah. What, what do you see? It, it's, it's everybody being on the same page and everybody understanding how to use stuff. We've seen people buy technology that turns into paperweights. We've seen yeah. people that use it, learn how to use it, use it correctly. And those are the guys that take off. So it's, it's getting the right, uh, the right technology, but having your team learn how to implement it the right way. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so as we look at uh, our, our slide here, of what success, I think that's exactly it. Um, being able to understand where to go get training, get education. Um, a lot of times we're, we're given technology and we go to, and we're told, well, just, just YouTube it and figure it out. Um, that doesn't inspire a lot of confidence mm -hmm. <laughs> from a team and or those new first couple of patients that you're like, hey, I saw this on YouTube. We're going to try it on you. Right. Um, but go and get training. Training is the biggest thing. Education, training. Um, here at 3D Infusion, we really want to demonstrate and, and emphasize live patient care is how you get training. Bring your team out, show your team, work together, create a solution, understand 
how your team will work together and, and their roles in treating a patient. Do it in a, in a safe environment so that when you're back in your practices, you're just, you're like clockwork and you're rolling and you're not, you're not there trying to figure it out right. on yeah. your own. And it just so happens we have a live patient implant training. Oh, we do. August 14th, 15th. Check us out at 3dinfusiondental.com and we still have a few spots available for that one. And we have an airway course September 11th and 12th uh, that you can register for as well. Perfect. Yeah. 3dinfusiondental.com. Look up the workshops. Great opportunity for you and your team to get out here. We're doing live patient. We're back in operational uh, here in Arizona. We've got a couple of protocols in place to, to help kind of mitigate any, any concerns with infectious disease protocol. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that as we go. But uh, come out. It's a great opportunity to get trained uh, and be trained coming back as you open up your practices, uh, depending on where you're at in the U.S. Uh, get that training now. Right. Yeah. So when you're opening back up you're you're already hitting the ground running. So. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit with that. We're going to jump into integration. We're going to talk about workflow. So as we look at this next little slide, workflow, workflow, workflow. And our, our patient today, James, that we're going to be stepping in with, um, a little bit of a history on James. Um, he came into us through the VA program, um, has a couple of missing teeth. Um, as we walk through his consult, you can see a, 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 an image of his 3D scan. And as we did an evaluation, he was a candidate to be able to receive some implant therapy. So once we have the, the consultation has been completed, we, we had uh, obtained our scans, uh, both our CBCT scans and our CEREC scans. So we have a digital, a digital scan that allows us to bring that digital model in and overlay it in the Galileo's implant planning software that comes with your Serona uh, CBCT uh, device. This implant planning software allows you to map nerves, look at sinuses, uh, look at all the physiology and, and, and anatomy to make sure that you uh, are doing the placing the implant in the in the best place possible. Um, if you look at this screen, you'll see a couple of implants that were planned. Uh, from there, we created and fabricated a, a, a Sara guide. So we want to demonstrate and talk about uh, a complete chair side solution, a complete digital chair side solution. So this is all done in your office. You're able to take this information, have complete control, uh, take the scans, design it through the implant planning software, export it to Sarek. Once it's back to CEREC, I can design the guide. I mill the guide. Once the, the guide is milled, um, which is there, we can see it. Um, I use my same mill unit. So I run a couple of different mill units. I run two mill units. They're, they're pretty much the same. One's a four motor, one's a two motor mill. Um, but we'll mix, from, we'll go from zirconia to uh, an implant guide to, to Emacs. And the team just changes the burrs over. It functions and runs just amazing. Um, I can do back to back guides out of the same machine. It takes about 20, 23 minutes to, to mill out a CEREC, a, a CEREC guide. And it's just a, an amazing opportunity. So I can have patient actually, if needed and they're traveling, show up for an implant, design within about five, 10 minutes, get the scans designed, send this information to my, my mill unit, design this or have this guide milled out. And in about 30 to 40 minutes, that patient coming in and being screened. I can have a guide and I can go a completely restorative driven implantology, placing implants confidently and can actually do it same day if I, if I want to. Um, from there, these are, this is the final. So we have the five implants placed uh, and the accuracy of the implants through the SARE guide is absolutely amazing. Um, uh, I've tested it, retested it. Um, I've done implants, scanned, rescanned to find out that, you know, to see exactly if my implants are going where my, my comb beam and my, uh, my plan is putting them, and they do it. It's, it's absolutely amazing to see the, the accuracy of this technology. And you're going to see now we're going to get ready to step into um, the chair with, uh, with our patient. Um, let me grab a couple of things, and uh, you're gonna, we're going to pan into that room where, where my team member, Megan, is working with uh, our patient, getting a final scans with the scan post uh, in, in place for uh, implant restore on tooth number 13, tooth number 20. Those implants, again, were placed prior. And now, because of the comb beam and placing those implants, I have the opportunity to do implant restored chair side. So a two-hour block or about an hour, hour and a half block of time, we'll do two implant restores. That's about, in my office, we're running right around $5,000, about $4,800 to do two implant restores. Um, so with that, let's, let's cue Megan. All right. Megan, how are we doing in here? Perfect. 
Fantastic. James, that's you. <laughs> <laughs> James today is getting two implant crowns. Be able to walk out today and chew some ribs and go after it with, uh, without any restriction. How's it been going, James? You've been doing good? Uh, 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 yeah. <laughs> doing good, keeping safe? Oh, yeah. Good, good. All right, let's take a look here. I'm gonna look at where we're at with our scans. I'm gonna have the camera pan right here. So as we go through and look at our scans, Megan's been working with us, or working on the patient. As, as you can see, the scans that she's taken, we've got our, our lower scan, we have our upper scan, which gives us our gingival mask. We have our buccal bite, so we're, we're actually working opposing today. So we have 13 and 14 that we'll be working together. And as you can see, we're actually gonna have two sites. We're gonna have two sites um, mesial to both of these teeth that have a, a, a dentist dentition which are gonna be prepped now that we have stability with uh, two implants here, we'll be providing implants for James uh, in the future to, to close that gap. Here's our, our image of our scan body. So if we look here, um, this is the, the Dents by Serona scan body uh, that's on top of a scan post. So if you're, in, if you're familiar with implantology and restoring implants, if you're old school, which is, or, or analog, I would say, um, you've got an implant level impression uh, where you're putting analog in, taking a, a, an impression of that, picking that up, setting that to lab. That's what this is, is the implant level. Um, the, the scan body is this, this device here. Let's go with the upper scan body, scan post. And this allows us to do this all chair side. So from here, this is fantastic. We're gonna move forward. Megan, those are great scans. Let's move forward. So from here, there's a little bit, with dentistry, there's a little bit of hurry up and wait. We're gonna hurry up and grab our scans. We're gonna send this to, to this information. Sarah's gonna take that information, bundle it all up, all up, give us a proposal of two crowns now that will go in. And so we're gonna be doing, providing restorations that are called a kind of an all-in-one abutment crown. So it's a one monolithic piece that's gonna be milled out from Sarah. That's gonna get jumped onto the tie base. So you have a tie base, you have the, the, the abutment and crown that are all-in-one that will be jumped onto that tie base. It'll be screw retained. We'll be going through and modeling that. We'll show you once that uh, these two crowns, we'll get them designed, get them into the mill unit. After they mail and come out, you'll see the Emacs in purple. We'll show that to you and how that fits onto the tie base. That will go into the oven. So hopefully the plan is today is that we can go through this process and in about an hour, have those crowns out of the oven, onto the tie bases, uh, into James's mouth, into the right position and be ready to kind of torque them, check the bite, and get them dialed up and done. As you can see, our patient, James, is, is uh, a couple of things where we want to talk about. As we bring our patients and start getting back to work post-COVID, some of the things we're looking at, um, our patients are being screened as they come in, whether they've been traveling, whether they feel sick. We test them with a thermometer. Obviously, we're checking for temperature, make sure that there's no issues there. Standard, we're checking their blood pressure and everything else that we were doing prior. Uh, we have our patients rinse with uh, the Listerine uh, Healthy White. I know there's a lot of discussion about whether that how much it does or doesn't do, but it does have uh, a hydrogen peroxide at about 1.5%, which we know 5% hydrogen peroxide does kill uh, the coronavirus. So anything we can do to stay healthy uh, and, and mitigate the exposure, keep our patients healthy, keep our team healthy, uh, we're trying to put in place. Um, so you'll see us kind of work back and forth. Our, our two patients today have gone through that protocol. Um, I'm trying to think of other things that we talk about when we talk about uh, the, this post-COVID haze that we're getting back to work with. But it's, it's kind of interesting as, as we get back to work and we're seeing our patients, um, our patients are so excited. Those of you, I think about 30% of Americans in the last report I heard is back to work or getting back to work as far as dental, uh, getting back into the office. Um, I don't know about those, of you. if you're out on the call right now and you're getting back to work, it's kind of fun to see patients really excited to come see the dentist again. So now we know where we rank. We've got quarantine, stay at home, shelter in place, and then we have dentistry, and then I think it's childbirth, and then, so that's where we, that's where we roll right now. So uh, that's awesome, Megan, we'll get moving forward. We're going to jump out and uh, talk a little bit more uh, about production and how this technology really works in our offices. Um, so we're going to cue back up the slide and uh, introduce you to Doug Fedig. Great, Megan, thanks. Discuss a little bit about the ROI side and some tax benefits right now. 
Um, Doug, up to you in what I imagine is rainy. Or <laughs> no, no, come on now. It's, it's a beautiful 80 degrees here. It's summer. We have our three weeks of summer. It started today. Uh-huh. Okay. So first of all, I want to thank Dan Spy and Henry Shine. And also, I, I feel a little bit out of place because normally I'm there in person with uh, the Sam and Doug show. I've, I've probably been at the 3D Infusion facility uh, 25 times or so as they hold their events. And it's an incredible facility and love being there. So anyway, I'm a dental CPA. I, I travel the country and I speak to uh, Dennis and, and your colleagues on the business side of dentistry. And as Sam said in his opening, one of my favorite uh, sayings is that you can't cost cut your way to prosperity. It's never been done. No business in the history of mankind has ever grown by cost cutting their way to prosperity. Because what happens is you focus on the expense side of the ledger when the real uh, profit margin is on uh, the revenue side and the production side. Quick story. Someone once said, well, what about Walmart? I said, good example. Walmart offers low prices. But Walmart is not cost cutting their way to prosperity. Walmart invested $10 billion into IT infrastructure in 2019. They're going to invest another $10 billion in 2020 because they're trying to keep up with a company called Amazon. Now, an example of a business that didn't invest in the future, have you heard of a company called Sears? There there may be a couple left. There may be one left in Portland. I don't even know. Sears used to be the largest retailer in the world, but they got caught flat-footed. So the moral of that story is no different for you, the practicing dentist. You're the CEO of your business. And when I talk to you folks in person, which hopefully I'll be doing again someday soon, I ask a question to the audience. I say, how many of you practice dentistry 10 years ago, the exact same way you practice it today? And hopefully none of you raise your hand. And then I say, how many of you think 10 years from now, you're going to practice dentistry the exact same way you're practicing it now? Once again, hopefully nobody raises their hand. I would now take that comment and I would even make it more specific. There's going to be a a dividing line for how you practiced dentistry pre-COVID and post-COVID. You and your colleagues are actually leading the way out of the shutdown and dentistry is leading the charge back to the new normal. But as part of that, you're going to incur some increased costs, correct? Um, Maybe you're spacing your patients out. Maybe after a hygiene visit, you're letting the aerosol settle, then you're doing some additional cleaning. All of that impacts your production. And the general, the general rule of thumb I've heard out there is that they expect, they expect revenues to be down anywhere from 10 to 30% for the year 2020 in the dental profession. Because a lot of you dropped to basically zero for several months, and now you're going to have to adjust to that new normal. So how are you going to do that? How are you going to maintain or increase your level of profitability if your production goes down? or if your number of patient visits go down, I should say. And I think the only possible answer to that question is technology. So let's think about, let's think about the power of this technology. So uh, Dr. Bowenkel, Sam mentioned that he was doing a power block, okay? And in, the, in a two hour period, he was going to generate about $10,000 worth of production. All right, so if we do the math, let's say for argument's sake, Let's say you're going to do that level of production one time per week. So one time per week, you're going to schedule that two-hour block of production that equals $10,000. If we do the math, that one time a week comes out to about forty grand a month, which comes out to about $500,000 per year for that one two-hour power block per week. So that's why I say technology is going to be the driver that's going to get you to be able to thrive in the new normal. And and I'm a dental CPA. I'm not a technician. I'm not a dentist. So I'm speaking generically about technology. And if you embrace technology, uh, it can drive your practice to new heights, which I see all the time with our clients. So let's say you take that now. So as a CPA, uh, I need to touch on depreciation. So if you remember back to your, um, your days when you got all that business training in dental school, all depreciation is, 
is it allows you to take the cost of a piece of equipment, you get to reduce it from the income you report to the IRS, and so therefore you're paying less in taxes. So if you took $200,000, you jumped into the digital pool, you invested $200,000. If you decide to depreciate that all in the first year, let's say you're at a 30% tax rate for argument's sake, okay? You just got $60,000 back cash money in taxes from the government for that depreciation. So pay $200,000 for digital equipment, we already got $60,000 back when we file our taxes. And then if you look at a financing plan, such as a plan that's currently being offered by Henry Schein, no payments for the first six months. For the next six months, you're paying $99 a month. Thereafter, you're paying that loan off at 3.5% interest, which trust me, low interest debt is your friend. And that's another thing I stress in my talks. A lot of you um, probably, you know, you may have heard of Dave Ramsey. Okay, Dave Ramsey's mantra is all debt is bad. Well, Dave Ramsey's talking to individuals who make 75 grand a year and have $10,000 in high interest credit card debt. Dave Ramsey's not talking to the CEO of a business, which is what you are as the owner of a dental practice. Every smart CEO in the world grabs low interest debt to grow their business. So you get that loan at three and a half percent, but you don't even start paying that really for the first year. So now you've bought $200,000 worth of equipment. You've gotten $60,000 back in depreciation. You're not making payments or you're making minimal payments for a year. When you start making payments at that low interest rate of three and a half percent, your payments are roughly $2,500 a month, okay? One, out, one power block per week, one two-hour power block at $10,000 production. You just generated $40,000 in production at a reasonable 40% profit margin. You just increased your profits by $15,000 or $16,000. Your monthly payment is $2,500. So when you put all that together and you look at the power of that technology, I think I think that the time um, I used to think the time was right. Now it's it's more imperative than ever that you look to leverage technology, whatever technology you choose to leverage, to grow your practice, to increase your production. So I know I threw out a lot of numbers there, but basically um, I want you to remember the 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 driver that that technology is going to allow you to come out of COVID, see fewer patients, establish a workflow that allows you to increase production with fewer patients and increase your profitability. I'm going to um, be available throughout this uh, webinar and even afterwards with my contact information. So I will be happy to address any questions that you have uh, around the business side of dentistry. And I really hope that when we, as we start to return to normal, that maybe I'll see you uh, at some point in person down at 3D Infusion with, with Sam and Doug in Gilbert, Arizona. So I will leave it right there and be available to address questions real time during the rest of this event or after the fact. Thank you very much. Thanks, man. Appreciate your time. Uh, we're going to keep you on the screen. I think there's a lot of questions kind of coming through. Um, let's see. Do we have uh, the moderator kind of got a couple of questions? I know. One of them, we're going to step back into the room in just a few minutes. One of the questions was uh, um, ab about uh, the accuracy of the implants uh, and where, you know, getting to where we're at today with this patient. We've got um, implant restore. So the ability to place implants um, distal to where I need them. So what I've struggled with my whole career in implantology, um, and most of it's been probably for three quarters of my career, it's been implant restore. Um, I recently introduced uh, implants five, six, eight years ago, somewhere in there. Um, but the, uh, it was always working with the specialist to get the implant in place, trying to figure out, you know, if, it's, if the implant's following the bone of that lower jaw, but the occlusions here, um, the, the specialist is telling me, well, that implant's the best implant I ever placed. They're telling the patient, 
man, this is fantastic. You're, you're going to love it. The doctor's going to love it. And the patient shows up in my office and I'm like, going, how in the world am I going to till 15, 18, 20 degrees uh, and upright my abutment to get my tooth into occlusion so it can actually function? Um, and it's always been a struggle. And when you talk about putting multiple implants side by side, how deep do they need to be? Uh, how do I create bony architecture so I can get restorations that look natural, that function that a patient can use, eliminate black triangles, and eliminate one fat side and one skinny side? Um, because, you know, when you're going in there live, when you're going in and doing free-handed in implantology, which we've done for years in dentistry, it's just by feel. It's that how good does that dentist, that specialist feel <laughs> about his angulation um, and his perspective of his angulation as that implant's being placed. And there's some guys that are really good. There's some that aren't. And I, I've just, for the years, I've just struggled with, okay, this implant's coming back, and how am I now going to restore that and give a patient something they can chew on and that's something I put my name on and I'm proud of. Um, that's all changed now that we've gone to this technology sector where comb beam can be in my office. I can have implant planning software that allows me to direct the placement of that implant. So that implant, not only am I in taking into consideration the bone that that implant's going in, I'm taking into consideration the occlusion, the bite, the neighboring teeth. I can see it all digitally at the same time. And then from that information that I create virtually, I can take that information and, and export that to my mill, guide, my, uh, mill unit in my office and mill out a guide uh, in 20 minutes. It's super efficient. It's, it's is, it's actually fairly inexpensive. I think uh, implant guide, uh, those, uh, uh, anybody that's out there that knows the pricing, $40, $60, somewhere in there for a, for a guide block. And this is a guide block. We'll come up real close to the screen. So this little guide block right here does this work here. We'll kind of come in here tight where it creates this guide in about 20 minutes. So 20, 25 minutes, I can create an accurate guide using um, the, uh, the, the, this workflow and create um, just the precision of where that tooth is going to be. So I, I, I have the restoration driving where my implant is going so that my implant now is in a place for me to restore. The, the thing that amazed me the most is as we started introducing this process and this protocol to our practice, my team became a little bit snobby maybe because <laughs> Wow. Yeah, they're a little, bit, a, little bit, a little bit implant snobs because we get an implant from oral surgeon, a very rapid oral surgeon, great guys doing great work. And like, oh, mm. we have to do that. We have to do, help them do that restore because they know when it goes through this guided system, their job is so much easier, so much more efficient because can, the precision can, is just unmatched. Can I, can I ask you guys a related question? Yeah. Because yeah. I get a question from Dennis that obviously I can't answer because I'm not one, but I, I've talked to Dennis who say, you know, I... I haven't taken the plunge and, and started doing implants and using a Comey. I, I, I don't think I'll be good at it. I don't, I don't know if I can do it as well as other people can. So how long do you think it takes somebody, uh, the average dentist, to become confident and, and good at utilizing the technology? That's a great question. Um, geez, everybody's so different. Um, you know, the, the confidence level, I believe, comes in understanding and trusting the technology and the training. Um, I have a lot of doctors that actually have come into our, our, our implant uh, training and workshops going live patient that have gone out of country. We've got some other programs. They place 25, 30 uh, implants, uh, call it what, dropping screws, right? They're out dropping screws. They come back, they're scared to death to actually do it in their office because the workflows, the protocol and working with a team isn't there. I found in my career, my practice, the doctors that come through that bring their, their team with them. The team inspires the confidence. So if the team's trained and calibrated and they trust the equipment and it's calibrated, we find that the onboarding of, the, of, of implants into their practice is very smooth. The learning curve is not super steep. It's just understanding and, and going through that training um, and then having a resource after the fact. You know, we have a, we have a great little community uh, here at 3D Infusion uh, being able to reach out, have questions. I know we had a, a good friend of ours that came through the protocol. Um, uh, the workflow and, and, and implant planning uh, uh, workshop with us right before COVID. <laughs> you planned three or four implants, COVID shut down, uh, all the practicing. And then as soon as they're coming out, he's like, okay, now what do I do again? How do I go back through that process? So 
uh, having having a community to rely back on, peers to rely back on, uh, is is super huge as well. Uh, and having that confidence to move forward with it, and the support from your Den Supply Serona rep, your Henry Shine rep, those teams that'll come in and give you the cookbook that you can follow. Absolutely, with the technology that you that you have through them. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question, though. Real, real quick, Sam, you touched on one thing that I think is critical. When I see people fail with the technology, it's almost always because their team didn't jump into the pool all in and they didn't get their team excited and they didn't have that passion in the office. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, I've had some of the teams that bring team members that need the implant. So the first implant is on like a team member that they have to work with all day long, or it's a family member, it's a mother-in-law and they're doing the first time I'd tell you what I'm talking about pucker factor, right? That person. But if, if, you know, when you have that confidence to do that type of treatment, uh, you do it in a safe setting, that, man, that boosts confidence. So being able to do it here in a safe environment, somebody watching over you, rather than having YouTube try to direct you on, on what implant, uh, uh, implantology should be in your practice, I think is a big Yeah, and using the piece. technology here that you've just bought that you're going to use back at your, your yeah. practice, and it's yeah. you know, waiting. When you it's the it. same stuff. If you, if you, it's the same technology, same workflows. That's, that's where that confidence comes in. Right. So we have one question. Uh, which one do you use most? All in one screw retained implant crown or hybrid two part crown? Uh, screw I imagine retained. You have some thoughts. Yes, I have a, a lot of thoughts. Screw retained. 90% of the time, 95% of the time, screw retained. The only time I will do the hybrid, the, the split file, uh, whether it's sending out to a lab, uh, you know, using Atlantis, for instance, uh, to, to do a, a custom abutment um, and splitting the file. Um, typically that's only anterior, um, anterior cases. You can really control your, your emergence profile, your, your CEJ of that uh, custom abutment and get the crown so that we want to, we want to, uh, eliminate the possibility of that cement, uh, seeping out that ultra thin, you know, layer of cement coming down and hitting the head of the implant causing, uh, implant failure. So screw retain, um, man, 95% of the time. Yeah. Great question. Other questions? Anything else we need to answer before moving forward? Thank I know there's some questions about the Prime Scan. It is a touch screen. It is absolutely amazing. Uh, it's 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 amazing to do that in front of a patient, pull it up, and they'll say just like our patient said here, um, "Is that me?" And and you just you you just you feel like Tony Stark's. You're going and throwing screens and moving things around, making teeth. Um, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. A lot of fun. The future is now. We have a question about medical billing. You know, that's something I don't want you to feel like we're we're ignoring your question. Uh, Complicated answer. It varies by state. It's something that we do talk about during our trainings here. Um, there's some great resources out there that your, your reps can certainly point you in the right direction and help you out a little more there. Tough one to, tough one to answer in a short manner here Perfect. tonight. So yep. we'll, uh, you know. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So we've got, uh, so at this point, uh, Doug, thank you for your time. Kick in and ask questions because he's been here. He knows the process. Uh, if we have more questions, obviously, um, I really want to direct a lot of my attention or focus or answers to if, if you're a dentist out there, you're on this call and you're just really looking at trying to purchase and what, what technology to purchase, how to purchase it, what's it really going to do for me? Those are, we, I want to be able to address uh, those questions, get you on uh, and, and uh, be able to answer those questions for you. I, I dove into it uh, three, uh, six, eight, six, eight years ago. Three, six, or eight. Yeah. Give or take. You know, I've been in practice 22 years. I've got six kids, two sets of twins. All right. I've got an excuse to have a little bit of, <laughs> sure, a little, no, a, little, a little crazy. That's I got a little craziness. I got one set of twins. I can relate. Yeah. I can it's imagine. weird. It's, in, yeah, it's around. Yeah. But that te the, um, when I dove into Combi, that was a game changer. That was a paradigm shift. I used that as a vehicle to change everything in my practice from the way we we treat patients the way they bring them in. Uh, we're going to walk through a little bit of what that looks like, um, I believe. Let me just see if that's kind of queued up next. It would be a great, great piece. Yeah, so if you haven't seen this terminology yet, disruptive technology, practice growth, and what that, you know, what does disruptive uh, technology mean to your practice and practice growth? <clears throat> a typical uh, cone beam scan uh, using an SLAI, um, one, or, or even uh, um, there's a couple other ones. Uh, I, I've got uh, a little older one, uh, an Elite Galileos. Um, fantastic machines. Um, 14 seconds. So look at your practice. When you have patients coming in, new patient, you have a patient that has a toothache, you have one that has a sinus infection, 
you don't know, or a, a, a radiating pain in the upper left quadrant that you think it's sinus, is it ear, is it TMJ, is it an affected tooth? Um, your team's going to come in and do x-rays. How long does it take them to gather that information? So if you evaluate this and look at your team taking 20, an FMX, 20 films, how long does that take? You've got 20 exposures, um, probably three, five, eight minutes, somewhere in there, kind of like how many how long I've had a comb beam. Um, <clears throat> 14 seconds to take a scan. 14 seconds produces anywhere from four to 600 images, and then the software models that and puts that down. So if you take a look at this slide, go large with that slide, because I think this is a, an impressive slide. Standard 2D imagery, what can you really see with it? We know we can't see anything up in the sinus. Um, it's overlapped, the roots are overlapped, the sinus is overlapped, any pathology is mixed in, and it, it's just kind of a muddled mess. When you introduce cone beam, if you look at that other image, the disruption to the way the perspective that it creates for you to be able to uh, understand diagnostics and diagnosing and, and patient interaction completely changes. I have an opportunity to, if you look at that, that image, I can look vertically down on the roots, I can look at the sinuses, I can look at the airway. I've got the airway modeled to the, to the right side there so you can see that the CEREC uh, scans, the CEREC models are actually imported into the image and I can show the patient, this is where your constriction is. It's, it's color coded, it's very easy to read. It, the patient education is amazing. It allows me to have conversations with my patients I've never been able to have. Um, and so what, that's, a, that's a picture of an image. We're gonna, we're gonna do a quick uh, um, read in here. We're gonna jump back into our patients and, and catch up with our team. Uh, while Doug was on and we've been talking, answering questions, the team has gone through, we've, uh, we've sent the design, the design crowns to uh, the mill unit. They've been milled out. Um, I believe they're going to show us real quick. We're going to go back to their room, and we're going to show um, just exactly kind of where we're at in that environment. So let's take a look. All right, fantastic. You know what? I'm going to let you uh, sit down in front of the screen, Megan. Um, I believe you have. Yeah, so do you want to open up? First, let's uh, show the design. So as we went through and did the design, if you take a look at that, um, this allows me to actually create teeth in the space and create the ideal bicuspid uh, look without the ability to put teeth in both the 12 and the 20 position, 21 position. Let's take a look at that. Yeah, 21 position. Um, that, that allows me to now create uh, the exact size that I want. So now I have an implant crowns that we're putting in. They're going to be, be functioning together, but I have also created teeth next door. So I have my my actual uh, contact strength and size exactly the way we want it. So once we add these restorations, when we scan to put in the implants for, for uh, the neighboring teeth, those implants go in when we go to restore, I've already got my plan. I know exactly what that's gonna look like. I can take this information digitally, virtually, tweak it, play with it, mess with it all I want, get it to the, the perfection that I need, and then now I can preserve it and transfer that to the patient. So it's amazing technology. I have not seen a system that can match this. I just, I just haven't. I've seen lots of different versions. I know there's some really techie guys out there that can open up files, move things around. Uh, but the consistency of being able to do this in my office to train my team and have other doctors come on and utilize this is, is just unmatched. Um, so let's show them real quick. We'll do a tight shot. Go ahead and open up uh, the model here, or the teeth here. So um, we're doing Emacs. We're doing the screw retained. Um, let's just show that one there you have open. Um, if you'll, you'll come over to, to up close to the, the camera here, come on over. You have the tie base. Go ahead and have the tie base. Yoni will hand you the tie base. So if you'll model that, putting that on. So this is the tie base from Dentist by Serona. <clears throat> this is the Emax uh, abutment crown all in one, one monolithic piece. And it just literally goes right on there. You don't need to have so back in the old days, we'd try to scan and get impressions of, of stock abutments, try to get down to our margins. This information has all been eliminated now. It's all digitally driven. So having a scan of that scan body over that scan post, it now knows exactly where um, my, my margin is for the tie base. So from here, that's great. Everything, that looks fantastic. We don't try this in the mouth at this point. We just make sure everything is fitting. We're gonna get ready, put it in the oven. So we're gonna bake these get those rolling. So the next time we see, uh, get back into uh, James and with Megan and Yoni, we're going to see the, 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 the fired Emacs crown. 
It's going to be on top of the, the tie base. It's going to be jumped on there. It's going to be in the patient's mouth. We're going to make sure we have confirmation x-rays that it's there. And we'll sit down, we'll torque, we'll put a little Teflon tape, a little filling material in there, and, and our patient's going to be done. So um, you're going to see uh, a lot of work going on behind the scenes that you're not going to get to see because you're not here live, <laughs> but it's happening. Um, and that's what happens in our practice when our team's uh, calibrated. This is happening. I'm doing hygiene checks. I'm greeting new patients. I'm working through admin. And my team has is, is, is been empowered to use this technology and really be able to provide service that is unmatched for sure. And we've said that a few times. We're going to go back out and we're going to introduce you to um, Scott, who's our airway patient today. Uh, he's gone through a, a little bit of a process. We're going to talk about airway, sleep dentistry, how to bring that into your practices uh, and how to do that in a way that uh, is a real benefit to your patients. So we're going to pan back out to our other, our, other, our, other, our other camera side. All right, back out here. Doug, any other questions? Anything we need to address? I'm running around a lot and Doug, I don't think you're, yeah, who planned all this? Perfect. So um, let's look and see. So let's uh, introduce you to Scott. Dr. Will, oh, we guys, yeah, go. Questions. Quick question. Dr. Konotsky out of New York, Jesse Konotsky, says, how important is manufacturer support when integrating tech into your practice? Maybe he's concerned about which manufacturer to go with. What do you think? How We have two of them here. <laughs> uh, manufacturer reps that are right. very helpful. So I think it's important to us. Yeah, it is. Uh, um, you know, there, there's a lot of different choices to make out in the environment. Um, I used to say uh, uh, it didn't matter as much. That was when I was probably a little more naive. Um, and so young in my career, um, one of the things I found to be probably the most powerful uh, tool of success in my practice are manufacturer reps. Manufacturer and dealer reps drive success in my practice. If I have a good relationship with them and understand they point me in the right direction, they introduce the right products, they can put me to the right training, um, uh, they can help direct from, from business to investment to product uh, to team. So you uh, use them for their knowledge? I, uh, uh, every week, every okay. day. Yeah, they probably get sick of me. Yeah, well, at least you're nice to them. That helps. <laughs> Uh, can you do this with Omnicam? You obviously have done both and I made do the both. jump and, to Prime and I scans. have two Omnicams. I have two Prime Scans. Um, yes, they both function fantastic together. Um, the Omnicam I've loved for years. Uh, it is a workhorse. It just makes crowns. Super simple. Um, I wouldn't say that it's intuitive, but you set your parameters, and literally I can just go click the buttons, hit everything exactly the way I need to, design, send it, and my team I, I have the confidence that my team can get everything done without needing me there every step of the way. It's, uh, it's a great product. Yeah. Cool. What else? Uh, are you using printed mo a printed model to check the contacts for the restoration prior to insertion? Uh, no, not. That's a great opportunity if, if, you, if you have 3D printing and you want to move down that direction. Again, I have found that the technology is accurate. The accuracy that comes from it, I don't have to overwork it. There's a, a couple of opportunities where if you're, you're sending out a custom abutment to a lab, I'll have them print a model so that I can try that in and then take that to the patient's mouth. When I do it chair side here with using CEREC, I just don't need to do it. I just haven't found the need to have that extra verification step. The accuracy is just, uh, it's, it's unbelievable. All right. Good questions. Great yep, questions. Keep them coming. All right, Are we next up, yeah. Let's introduce you to our next patient. So where we've modeled, you've seen uh, our implant restore. We've had our airway patient in the chair as well. There's a couple of things that are happening with him. Let's go back to the screen. So Scott was come through our hygiene program and you'll see he got a little scan. So all of our patients get a comb beam scan. Uh, new patients will get a comb beam scan for bite wings. Uh, we'll, we'll, I'll see more information for that new patient exam and that than I'll, I'll see with 20 2D films. So protocol in our office now with comb beam is that CBCT, four bite wings. We may take some PAs of the anterior if we need to. Um, and then that information. And that information we determined in walking through and talking with Scott that he had, uh, uh, we were able to screen and kind of evaluate a possible obstruction. So there was a, a smaller airway um, and we could take a look. So let's take a look at, I think I have this scan though. Uh, we'll pull up the scan in the room, but we're able to see a slight constriction. With that constriction, 
uh, in discussion with Scott uh, and, and just basically probing questions, screening questions about uh, a couple of habits and a couple of health uh, comorbidities, determined that he might have uh, obstructive sleep apnea. Now, as a dentist, obviously, we cannot diagnose. That's not our place to diagnose obstructive sleep apnea. As a matter of fact, you can't prescribe obstructive sleep apnea unless the patient's asleep. The patient's asleep. So in order to do that, that really moves into the medical field. But we can assist on that. So I've had a lot of discussions with patients uh, and a lot of grateful patients that, that see me. And I have a relationship. We see them every six months, every year. They see their primary care physician when they're 40. Uh, to get that check when they're 50, and very rarely are they actually seeing a primary care. And even in the primary care in the, in the general practitioner environment, very few have a tool that can go through and screen for obstructive sleep apnea. So it's a, it's a great opportunity to provide a service for patients that if you're not doing it currently, uh, it's amazing to see what it changes. One of the things I found in my practice, I was misdiagnosing for the last 15 years or previous 15 years, uh, misdiagnosing uh, clinching and grinding. So I have patients with TMJ dysfunction, pain, clinching, grinding, headaches. Um, you see erosion on the teeth. You saw a lot of things that you're like, wow, you're really stressed out. And it's like, you know, the, the guy doesn't have any reason to be stressed out. His just teeth are just being destroyed. Come to find out as we start learning more about obstructive sleep apnea, one of the comorbidities is that patient trying to get air, flexing their jaw and destroying their teeth. I'm putting night guards and occlusal splints into patients for years and they're chewing right through them. I'm like, how does that make sense? What, what are we missing? And that obstruct the link of, uh, and, and being able to understand obstructive sleep apnea uh, was, was the key. So with that, we went through and we, we provided uh, our patient with an HST, a home sleep study, uh, sent him home. And, and it's, a, it's probably pretty hard to see, um, and I can't zoom in on it, but uh, if, you'll, if we look at this, you'll see red and green. And on the far right side, that red side, you're going to see that he had about uh, 41, 47 episodes um, of apneic episodes or, or disturbances in an hour. So as we start walking through, we're going to uh, introduce Shiresh uh, to, the, to the panel here in just a few minutes and have him walk through uh, the sleep, simple sleep solution, give a little background on obstructive sleep apnea and its comorbidities and how it affects our patients. But when I look at his scan, when we get this back from a, a home sleep study, he had over 2,000 snoring events. Um, he had 47, uh, an AHI of 47. Uh, you look at his oxygen level. That's one that I, I, I hold dear and near to my heart. Um, as somebody with obstructive sleep apnea, waking up with headaches, having fatigue for years, knowing that I had obstructive sleep apnea but not understanding how to treat it, even treat myself, um, was a, really a journey of, of understanding what this means uh, to a person in their life. But when I see a, a, a report like this one uh, we saw on Scott, um, his O2 went down to, I think, in the 70s. Um, if you're in a hospital and you drop to, what is it, about 90, 92, they're going to put Alarm starts there. going off. Alarm goes off. You're going to be put onto oxygen. You drop into your 80s. You drop into your low 80s. They're intubating you. That, that, you he's dropping into the 70s while he's asleep. Um, just crazy that our bodies can maintain and go through that night after night after night and the breakdown that that, that happens. So a great opportunity to, to walk through with Scott. And so what we did is after we got the HST, uh, we introduced Zephyr. And, and this is where um, uh, Shresh is really going to shine and show us kind of what's happening. But we went through the process of getting our molds uh, and, and getting the Zephyr device ready to send Scott home and, and, and get a theragnostic test. And what that is, is that's take, that theragnostic test is coming in and moving uh, Scott's jaw slowly forward and backward to determine the exact point that it, he responds best to mandibular advancement therapy uh, to treat uh, obstructive sleep apnea. So in the previous, if, you, if you've done some sleep or you haven't, one of the biggest hurdles in sleep dentistry has been for me, um, we, we we arbitrarily set the mandibular positioning and, and then send the patient home with a device that moves their jaw forward 60% of full protrusion. And then we tell them, give you two weeks, come back, give you two weeks, come back. And we manipulate and titrate that position until the patient responds to us, yeah, that feels good. I think I'm getting the best therapy and the best sleep I can. 
and then we'll do another test and test and see how much of improvement it is. That is now, especially post-COVID, just a tremendous amount of time, energy, PPE, exposure to the patient, exposure to my team. That's just not necessary. Now that we have Zephyr, uh, and we've had it for a little while, but when you get trained in, with Zephyr, you pick up, I, I know there's a lot of doctors out there that have bought uh, comb beams from, from Dental Supply Serona. The Zephyr has been included with it. Get the training. It's an amazing product. You can create this ability for the patient to take home a theragnostic test, move them forward and back, and have a prescribed percentage that that patient's going to respond to. That is absolutely amazing. The other side of it um, is to understand that some patients just are non-responsive. They just don't respond to mandibular advancement therapy. So if you're to move a patient into mandibular advancement therapy and they're not responding, you're, treat, you're not providing this correct treatment. You need to have a discussion with the patient to, to, to understand you need to go to forced air. Just understand, work with, a, you know, work, work with a, a sleep center, work with a primary care, understand how this work goes back and forth so you as a medical provider can actually be, be, do something that's beneficial for your patient. Uh, it's a huge, huge piece. So uh, with that, I believe uh, with the Simple Sleep Solutions. Well, uh, you've done a great introduction. Uh, I'll just move forward through um, the quick little introduction uh, slides here. As you mentioned, I am the uh, Chief General Officer at Zephyr Sleep Technologies. These are some of the conflicts of interest that I have. Mostly, of course, when I start talking about the product, I am a shareholder of the company and I've been a co-founder since 2010. Uh, but with that being said, uh, as you mentioned earlier on there, Sam, uh, we all hear about sleep these days, right? We know the impact of it on our physical health, mental health, work health, life health, everything. So it's a big issue, and a lot of patients are getting misdiagnosed for different medical problems they're having, there, whether it's depression, whether it's anxiety, whether they had a heart attack, sleep apnea puts patients at about 23 times more risk of a heart attack. And it's a big, big medical problem. But at the same time, uh, it, it doesn't just stop at the level of medical. You know, uh, when we first got into uh, dental sleep medicine about 15 years ago, it was all about the medical consequences. But now we've learned actually that uh, consequences of untreated sleep apnea happens to be a lot more impactful on our dentistry. Uh, we know patients, as you mentioned, with bruxism, almost 70 to 80% of these patients have a sleep apnea as well. Whether or not the cause of bruxism is sleep apnea or not, we're not 100% sure about that. But what we do know is the conventional therapy, for instance, in a splint that we're going to put in their mouth, could make their sleep apnea worse in about half of these patients. No wonder some of them are not getting used to the treatment that we're providing for them because they're just getting less air into their body. We now know it's impossible, very, very difficult to manage periodontal disease in patients that have a sleep apnea as well. And with dentistry now, as you mentioned, we know a lot more impact that it has on dentistry as well. So in a way, we cannot really do proper interdisciplinary comprehensive dentistry by ignoring airway and sleep. So I want to make sure everybody understands that it goes beyond just being a medical disease, although it has life-threatening problems and it can impact a lot of our patients, but the impact of it goes beyond just simple medicine. If it impacts our implants, there are studies that shows patients with a sleep apnea have higher rate of um, restorative failure in implant therapy. Of course, big correlation between sleep apnea and TMD and pain. A lot of patients with a sleep apnea have high levels of inflammatory markers in their body, interleukin-6, interleukin-8, and they have higher perception of pain because of lack of them. They have what we call hyperalgesia. Uh, sleep apnea on orthodontic and pediatric population. We know about that as well. A lot of kids with uh, orthodontic problems have a sleep apnea as well, and that results in misdiagnosis of uh, problems such as ADHD. So what I'm trying to get across is just the impact of a sleep goes beyond just medicine. It is impacting everything that we do in our dentistry and every kind of dentistry that we're doing as well. So with that being said, uh, I like to start with saying sleep and airway assessment should be part of comprehensive dental oral health assessment. So if you're watching this webinar, I want you to look at it. whether you choose to treat sleep apnea or not, that's your choice. Of course, we're gonna get into Matrix Plus and how treatment planning and how theranostic testing is gonna make it very simple. Technology is gonna help us a lot with that, but it's not a choice whether or not we're screening for airway and a sleep problem. So every patient in your clinic that is walking through the door, and I'm sure Sammy would agree with that one as well, it is very, very important to screen them for airway and sleep problems Otherwise, we're basically 
putting the prognosis of our dental treatment at risk as well. Especially when we realize there was about 1 billion of these patients out there. So everybody that's walking through your door in everyday uh, clinical dentistry could be potentially suffering from sleep apnea as well. So what are the treatment options? Uh, CPAP, oral appliance therapy, surgical treatments, behavioral strategies, and more novel treatments such as hypoglossal nervous stimulation and other types of surgeries. But oral appliance therapy is a good therapy, is a good alternative to CPAP. And as I said, a lot of patients prefer that. A lot of dentists are getting involved in it. As you mentioned, Sam, we get to see these patients every three to six months. So we're in a great position to actually help these people, not by just changing their lives, but literally saving their lives. And it's very, very important because at the way the dentistry is going in the next decade, and it has been in the past few years, we're moving more towards the wellness and the total health and the impact of oral health on that, as opposed to just drilling, filling, and dealing with just single tooth dentistry. And sleep is a great segue into that. So it's a great opportunity for all of us to get involved with the health of our patients and start helping them in that way. What are the good things about oral appliance therapy? We said most patients like it. It works really great. Uh, it's very simple to make, very easy to travel with, but it's not as beautiful as we thought it was. It, we know it only works in about 60 to 70% of total patients. So it doesn't matter who the patients are. If you give them an appliance, only 60 to 70% of these patients are actually going to respond to oral appliance therapy. And that being said, it only counts for about 5% of the market. So there is a huge potential for us to be able to expand our clinic, especially as you said, in the post-COVID world, when the drill and fill and aerosol uh, generating dentistry may be limited due to all the restrictions that we have. And we may wanna be focusing more on high value, high revenue dentistry, which happens to be life-saving and a great service to our patients as well. Or appliance therapy has a lot of other challenges as well. Of course, we don't know who it works for. We don't know where to set the mandible historically. Uh, communication with physicians is important. The challenges with conventional models and non-digital workflow, those are the things that always help back or appliance therapy. A uh, few things that we've got to keep in mind as well. The definitions that we use in sleep apnea, these are not arbitrary. These are set by our medical colleagues. There is some confusion around, around airway and sleep apnea. Airway and sleep apnea, although they're closely related, there are two different problems. They're not exactly the same. What do I mean by that one? Well, a lot of sleep apnea patients have a smaller airway, but it doesn't necessarily mean your daytime and nighttime breathing is the same. Um, sleep apnea happens while you're sleeping, and it needs to be diagnosed while you're sleeping, and it needs to get treated while the patient is sleeping. So uh, playing around with the definitions of a sleep apnea is not a good way of going about it. We need to stick to the same therapeutic definitions, which is a 50% reduction in AHI and bringing the AHI below 10. So we, can we cannot leave our patients untreated. What is the solution here? It seems very complicated. Well, the solution is trying to simplify this by using technology. So in a way, we're safely simplifying oral appliance therapy and being able to predictably help these patients and make it available to a lot of dentists. And that is exactly what Zephyr has been focusing on for the last 10 years, and that is simplifying oral appliance therapy for patients. And not unlike everything else that we do in dentistry, we've been talking about implants all day today, treatment planning happens to be key. Before jumping into making a device, we need to spend time to understand the patients and understand what therapy is going to work for them. And two key components of that happens to be whether or not they're going to respond and exactly at what mandibular position. And then we can combine that with our clinical findings and do a proper treatment plan for these patients. Of course, technology is going to help us accomplish that. I will be focusing on Matrix Plus. I know we've been talking about 3D imaging quite a bit. I do want to emphasize on that the fact that the visualization, the visualization is key when it comes to treatment consultations with these patients. Uh, what we've noticed in our clinic, the conversion in patients when they can visualize their airway and understand that emotional connection with their own body and anatomy makes a huge difference in case acceptance, along with proper treatment planning, of course. Um, there are some uh, confusion whether or not uh, airway imaging allows us to predict treatment outcome. I want to make that very clear. We cannot do that. There is no evidence as of today that imaging will help us predict whether or not oral appliance is going to work, but it does help us with making patients understand what their problem is. And as I like to say, it's not treatment plans that make patients better, it's the actual treatment. So patients saying yes to treatment is very, very critical and very, very important. 
So that kind of leads us into feedback mandibular, feedback control mandibular positioner, which is the Matrix Plus. Matrix Plus basically is a technology driven by an artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithm that allows us to know exactly which patients are going to respond to oral appliance therapy with over 99% uh, predict positive predictive value and accuracy. And also will give you the exact position where that device can be made where the airway is gonna be remaining open all night long. So we don't have this blind titration of going back and forth and bringing the patients multiple times into our clinics, especially in these environments where every turning the room around is added PPE cost and a risk of being exposed to some aerosol and possibly putting your team and other patients at risk. The way the technology works, I'm sure one of the reports as you've seen, it is, it's gonna automatically move your mandible throughout a night in 0.2 millimeter increments. I do have a graph that is coming up. In a way, it's studying a patient's airway and physiology and response to mandibular protrusion throughout the night while the patient is sleeping. Very, very important. We are not waking the patient up. The patient is sleeping. They are in their natural sleep environment. And we are studying to see what happens with their physiological signals in response to that mandibular protrusion. Then it gathers that data, combines it with another set of data from the second night, and it makes a prediction based on that, which is all done by through machine learning and artificial intelligence. The report looks like something like this. You get two valuable information out of it. One is whether or not our patient is going to respond to oral appliance therapy. And as you can see, as long as they're to the left of that graph, you can be basically 100% sure that the appliance is going to work for them. And it will give you a millimeter value of exactly where the mandible needs to be. And just for those of you who are wondering, zero happens to be the edge to edge position. Uh, there are some patients that require one, two, three millimeters of protrusion. Some patients require no protrusion. And very important to recognize, it does not correlate to their AHI, severity of disease, or BMI. It depends on their phenotypes and endotypes. It's a very involved kind of a discussion. And, and with these two pieces of information, whether they're responders and at what position, we can do a proper treatment planning and put together a whole plan for this patient to going ahead in terms of what device and how to manufacture that device. For them. So in a sense, we're using computer control mandibular positioning. The movements that is happening throughout the night, these are feedback control movements. These are not pre-programmed movements. And the data that is gathered from that signals that comes from the sleep study then is fed into a machine learning artificial intelligence algorithm. And that's how we make the prediction. So this is what the study clearly looks like. As you can see on the five panels that we have here, six panels that we have here, on the top, we have the mandibular positioner. So you can see throughout the first night, the machine is moving the patient's mandible. In average, it looks at about anything between two, 300 and upwards of 500 position throughout the night, which is only possible utilizing technologies like this. Then it looks at their oxygen, their flow, their pulse. So we're really studying the patients and monitoring the patients throughout the whole night in their sleep. And again, that's very, very important. They need to be in their physiological sleep. And that is exactly what we do with Matrix Plus. The second night, as you can tell, the machine is kind of uh, looking at fine tuning that position and gathering more data. We can see the position, whether they're sleeping on their side, whether they're sleeping on their supine position, whether they're sleeping on the left versus right. So we can gather all that information and be able to make sure the study was actually recorded properly. Uh, what does it allow us to do? As I said, it allows us to simplify and increase our efficiency, not make an appliance for a patient that is not gonna work for it. Don't waste our time, don't waste their time. Just get right to that precision medicine. And most importantly in our studies we have shown in average, compared to conventional oral appliance therapy, which takes anything between three to five or six follow-up visits for these patients to keep coming back to blindly titrate them, with utilizing our technology and our protocols, we can cut that amount to down to one visit for about 87% of the patients. And there is a very few patients that needed to come back a couple of more times. What does that mean? That means that less share time, less exposure, less aerosol, better efficiency, higher revenue, and most importantly, better patient experience. It's like anything else that we do in dentistry. Patient wants to come in, they want to get treated, they want to the treatment is going to work for them, and they want to minimize the number of the times that they have to come see us. So this is what it allows us to do. But another thing that's very important to recognize is when we go with that arbitrary selection of the protrusion, we have to realize that we could be creating issues with 
oral appliance therapy effectiveness. What do I mean by that one? Well, imagine if you start a patient at the 67% that Sam mentioned. When we look at this patient here, if the required protrusion was less than 60%, we have already over protruded this patient right off the bat. What does that mean? That means that possible more discomfort, possible more side effects. And because of that, the patient may not be able to tolerate the device, which would be considered a treatment failure. Or if the patient required more protrusion, and if you start on 70%, it means that we've got to bring them back. And at some point, the patient may not want to come back anymore because they're giving up on the therapy in that sense, or possibly they may be in that the non-treatable, they're non-responders in general. So overall, what the system allows, the platform allows us to do is allows us to treatment plan properly by knowing whether a patient is going to respond at what position. Also, the cloud platform that the Zephyr provides allows you to connect with the physicians. Those are some other stuff. Helps you with the medical billing, connect you through the other uh, providers as well. Allows you to connect with your patient. If the data is not recorded properly, you don't have to bring the patient back. This is all cloud-based. And in summary, what the technology is trying to do outside its mechanical and you know, technology side of it it's trying to create an easy, predictable, and simple workflow that allows you to implement oral appliance therapy very simple into your clinic. That's a very quick, brief, brief summary of the whole technology. Uh, I have my emails and stuff up here if there is any questions, but I'm going to get rid of the slideshow here and come back out here to see if there is any questions or not. And I know we've done that uh, matrix study for the patient last night that Sterling sent to me a little bit earlier on. I'm going to see if I can share that one. If there's any questions, Sam or uh, Doug, do you want to say anything? Let me know while I'm sharing this here. All right. Our teams are, are, are working strong here. Uh, following up with Airway. Thank you, uh, Shresh. That's amazing information. Um, you know, I, I think there are a few things that keyed on my mind. The accuracy, uh, being able to use that technology, uh, patient care is, is just, uh, with, with Zephyr, is changing the way I look at being able to treat patients uh, in, in the sleep arena, the OSA, and, and my patient base. Do yeah. you have anything else to add to that? No, Doug? I mean, I'm a, I'm a sleep patient here. Yeah. Uh, it's changed my life. I think I wonder why everybody doesn't do it. And I think the answer is is because if you don't do it right, there's a lot of trial and error. And I think when, when we talk to the people that have implemented it, um, it can be difficult if you don't know what you're doing. You don't have the right tools to get the job done. But with the uh, SLAI, unit from Serona for your scans, the use of Zephyr to get, you know, again, I was pre-Zephyr, so I had to guess with <laughs> titration levels and I had the, the, the pain, couldn't chew gum for a week. Uh, so being able to eliminate that challenge was huge for me. And uh, I think with the resources and the tools, it, it, it's something that can be life-changing for so many patients just by having the right, the right cookbook to get it done. No, it is. I had one patient that uh, we were working with and traditionally you're looking at setting them at 60% of max protrusion. There's some training that goes with that if you're not familiar with what that means. But you never took them to 90 or 100% of, of protrusion. It just, that's just not the way you did it. You did 60 and you typically backed it off. I had a patient that went through the, the theragnostic and their, their optimum positioning was 90% of protrusion. I never would have gone that way ever. I would have fiddled around with 60, 40, 50, 30, 25 and just told the patient that you're going to be sore and you're going to get an okay result. They prescribed them at 90. We put them at 90. They absolutely had no pain. They had no joint discomfort. They didn't have any, it, it, it absolutely blew my mind. So it's, you know, understanding technology, understanding the algorithm, understand that there's some really smart people out there that are there to help us understand how to deliver patient care and, and do it at a level that is just, you know, unprecedented. So, yeah. Uh, anything else, Suresh, you want to add to that? No, no, you said it really well. It's just knowing your final destination. It's not different from anything else that we do in industry. We need to know where we want to go, and that that's, makes it easy for us to figure out that pathway. Uh, very easy training. Uh, our team does a great job in terms of the customer support and onboarding. It's a very intuitive technology that way. I know you guys do a great job at 3D Infusion for training. Uh, but key is to do sleep just like what we do anything else in dentistry and doing it predictably and doing it in a safe manner. I always joke with uh, my attendees, I tell them, well, uh, if our crown was only successful 60 to 70% of the time, how many, of the, how many of you would have done crowns? If our implants were only successful 60 to 70% of the time, and it was a matter of trial and error, as you mentioned, how many of you would have done implants? Not that many. Somehow there was this misnomer that we can do this in sleep 
And that's perfectly fine, which is funny because the sleep is a life-threatening disease. We need to be as accurate and as predictable, and just as you said, technologies such as imaging technologies, such as Zephyr technology, technologies such as intraoral scanning puts it all together, which makes it really easy for new guys that are coming into the field. So they don't have to go through the same things that you and I have went and done that trial. Well, well said, well said. Um, thank you so much, Shresh, for your time. Great yes. comment. Um, I hope everybody out there on this is, is understanding the, the depth and the magnitude of what's being discussed, because that is, that is an amazing concept to, and philosophy to understand. Um, you've noticed that we've been back and forth a little bit with Shresh, with Doug, where, where you're here with me and Doug, the Sam and Doug show kind of walking through here. What's happening in the operatory? So if you've noticed, we haven't been in, I haven't been in there a whole lot as, a, as the dentist and the practitioner. We're at about 5.20 Arizona time, so we've been going at it about an hour. So that, that two-hour power block's been cut down to an hour. We're trying to demonstrate this type of technology, what kind of production you can do in an hour. So we're at an hour. So the dental hour is what, about an hour and 20 minutes, hour and 30 minutes? It's not a true hour, right? Yeah. It's, it's so, like so understand where we're at. We've got a lot of discussion, but also understand what I've been doing. So as a practitioner, what's been my exposure to the patient? To, to where, where, how much time have I had to be in the room? Um, you know, am I in there grinding? Am I being exposed? What's happening? Um, as as you're, we're panning through, the, you can see my team's in both rooms. They're working with the patients. They're getting everything finalized. That's happening. When you get a team calibrated, they're working it. They're flexing the technology. The exposure is minimized. Um, the efficiencies are, 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 are driven through the roof. Um, so we're going to finalize. We're going to close out our power block. I'm going to step in with our airway patient. Um, Anna's just finishing up with him. <clears throat> and she's getting ready now with the scans, with the steric scans that she has the digitally, how to upload them, marry them to the cone beam scan in the CCAT software to be able to that now digitally trans just transfer and send those out for a sleep device. Um, so amazing technology. We charge about 19 in, in Gilbert, Arizona, about 1995 for this process. So we've got 1995 happening in room one. I've got about, uh, what, 48, did I say 48, 4,600 happening in room two. That's about $6,800. Uh, I'm not a CPA, Doug, you, you can, you can close the loop with me on that and add the decimal points, but about 65, $6,800 we just did in an hour. Um, and my time, the stress on my body the the physical toll just isn't there. It's not what I experienced the first 10, 15 years of my career. Trying to provide care um, has completely changed now that I've moved into technology. So if you're considering it, you're down this road, you understand this is going to change your life, absolutely change your life. I mean, we talk about patient experience, talk about doctor experience. It has absolutely changed my life. I'm excited to be at dentistry. I'm excited to be a dentist. I'm excited to, excited to provide care. Uh, I'm reinvigorated and inspired to do something different than just uh, drill and fill, be a molar monkey, you know, all the, all the, the typical, uh, you're not really a doctor, doctor comments that yeah. you get uh, traditionally in the, you know, concepts of being a dentist. So um, love it. Let's step into, let's go look at our airway patient. Anna, how we doing? doing well. Okay. You ready? All right. Our scans are ready. Perfect. Scott, how are you doing? doing great. You excited to get some sleep? Yes. This is... so excited. <laughs> My wife's even more excited. Well, you just come to the dentist's office more often. You yeah. sit here and just take a nap. We, we, this, is, this chair has a massager in it, by the way. So you can actually mas get a massage, sit here, take a nap, because you're not sleeping at home from the, from the sleep study. You're not getting anything there. Um, Anna, let's move, to, let's move to your screen there. And let's move forward and demonstrate. To, so we're ready with uh, all the information. To move forward and order our CCAT uh, appliance. So this is our CEREC information. So we, we, we've taken the CEREC scan just like we do for a crown um, or even as we're scanning for uh, implantology. So we're going to load our, our CEREC uh, CAD CAM information, our model. This is the hurry up and wait part. There we go. And choose the model. So from here, she's going to create opportunities for the, the model then to match the, uh, the, C, the uh, um, CBCT. So 
So while she's doing that, I'll just ask, you know, Scott's a big sports fan. He's been having some issues. I'm in withdrawals. You're in withdrawals. Major There's withdrawals. nothing happening. No. We're watching Cornhole, watching cornhole, cornhole Championships, yeah. and that's, that's the extent of our sports. It, it was it was pretty it was it was amazing. Yeah, I watched it seven times. Though. Yeah, I tell you what, it was all four airmail. There is that was a that was impressive. Yeah. All right, from here, Anna is creating the fiduciary markers. She's clicking on the model. She's she's setting that to the uh, to the CBCT guys. So CBCTs come out as a DICOM, and then she's she's matching now the Seric information to that. She's going to move that forward. Now, doctors, a lot of times I will do this as well, depending on what my team's doing. They gather this information, can excuse the patient. So this, this the day with this, the, with the patient here is a fairly quick appointment. We typically keep them to an hour or a little bit less. Um, and this allows my team to gather the information, do it chair side to make sure it matches, uh, do it very efficiently. Um, as, as they get more confident in it, scans are taken, patients are dismissed, and, and we're able to model this. Uh, as we're turning over a room. So whether it's uh, uh, Anna that's doing it or gathering the information or one of the other assistants or or they're pushing it back to me, I'm pretty much just at their mercy. So they're telling me what to do. So there it is. It's modeled. We're going to add to cart. And so this is actually can be done during lunch. It can be done during exams. Um, the amazing thing with this is the, the accuracy that's attached to this device uh, is absolutely amazing. Um, we're able to, to take this information and the accuracy. The first couple of times that we did this, as I, as I modeled with our patients a couple of years ago, um, the, the images looked okay. Like, oh, that's going to be fine. And, and I'd get a call back from CCAT going, yeah, you're missing information. We're, the precision from this this milled um, device is just is absolutely uh, amazing as well. So it's not a suck down. It's not uh, uh, a 3D printed. It is uh, literally a CNC milled guide that, or a device that goes on the top and bottom teeth, locks on, very comfortable, very sleek, allows the patient to have their jaw in a position where their um, ability to, to actually um, participate. So one of the issues that we have with treating obstructive sleep apnea with patients is the um, uh, ability for that patient to actually perform, put the CPAP on. So they become see what they call CPAP intolerant. They just can't handle that air. They can't sleep with it. So they're diagnosed, but they're not going to receive treatment because it's just too uncomfortable and it just doesn't work. Uh, we have a couple of devices out there, a couple of sleep devices. Uh, if you look them up, man, I, I couldn't handle having a five pound puck of plastic in my mouth I that I just could not sleep with that so this this device from CCAT is amazing it's super sleek super uh, slim we call it super sexy because the other ones are just horrible um, and it's a great opportunity to patients all uh, the patients that I've used this one every single one of them have been compliant they use it they use it they use it um, they'll they'll just and they 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 swear by it so um, great opportunity for Scott to treat get treated to work forward Thank you for being with us, Scott. That's moved forward. Okay, so we're done here. We're gonna pan back over to our, our implant restore. That was done uh, and just finished that before I stepped into here. So that implant was, those two implants were torqued. We checked the bite, we taped, but Teflon tape, we polished and, and filled them. So let's step back there and we're gonna close out our power block. All right, okay. All right, we're back with James. We're gonna close out this power block. James, how are you doing? <laughs> bark and bite i'm gonna have uh, the cameraman pan over to the screen let's take a look at these these films all right so this is our confirmation so we've uh at this point uh the team has put the implants in place uh we've torqued them we have the verification x-rays they're again occluding next to each other and you can see the bone levels between the two are going to be great for accepting implants in the future I'll tell you what, let me have you pan as well over to the, the patient. I'm going to have uh, uh, Megan retract, and let's take a look, see if we can zoom in on that.
All right. Fun stuff. Can we see the clues along that? Can we get a mirror to turn? Yeah, yeah. Let's look at that. Let's see if we can zoom in on that. So, guys, this is amazing. When you can look there um, and zoom in on that, uh, the Ivaclar with their Emacs have an Empress composite that matches this Emacs. So, when we go to do the implant restore, we tape, we put this implant material, uh, this temporary or the, the composite material in for the final restoration. It's, it's almost impossible, even with loops, to look in there and see the difference in the delineation. So, for patients, it's a great solution. They brush, they flush. It's a great opportunity to, to restore their bite and do a screw retain, uh, impre or a screw retain restoration. Uh, in the past, I remember we've done some of these and you have kind of this black dark hole. And so the patient's always, looks like I have a cavity on my tooth. That no longer is the issue. Awesome. Thank you. James, bite together for me. How's it feel? Absolutely outstanding. Nice. What are we eating for dinner tonight? Walnuts. Walnuts. <laughs> I'm going to crack some walnuts. I'm going to sit you up here. I'm going to have the team get you ready and get you excused. Uh, with that, we're going to come back out to the main room and answer some questions and hopefully uh, be able to close out today. Thanks, thanks guys. Thank you. thank you to my team. And, James, thank you. Thank you for your service, by the way. Appreciate your time. Thanks, guys. All right. We are back out. Well, Doug, what do we got? Any, we got some good questions to answer. Anything extra? No questions. Which I can only imagine because we've answered everything so thoroughly. So thoroughly. We've explained everything so clearly. Or they started drinking a long time ago. Well, that's, that's what we do usually, <laughs> but I wouldn't project that onto everybody no, else. Not everybody else. Okay. So I think we're good. Any uh, Doug Fettig uh, out of rainy Portland, Oregon, any last thoughts? <laughs> Final thoughts. Technology absolutely is the answer to help you thrive post-COVID. You can see fewer patients. You can increase your production. I'm not a technician, but I, I know the data. I know the numbers. So embrace technology. That's my final message. Thanks, Doug. And you're right. I was smart enough to leave Seattle, <laughs> Phoenix, which everybody should do. I urge anyone in the Northwest to make the move. It's worth it. Just got to fight scorpions in your backyard yeah, every now that's, and then. That's not, not too terrible. We do have a question from uh, Laura. Can you do angulated screw channel restorations? Yes, you can. Uh, chair side, not yet. Uh, that's a, an Atlantis workflow. Um, my team has been working more into that Atlantis workflow uh, lately. Great workflow. Um, the patient can basically come in for their torque test uh, 10, 15 minutes. Absolutely takes none of my time. Um, they'll They'll take off the, the healing cap, put in the, the uh, Astra um, impression analog, that digital coping, scan it, and we'll send it and we'll prescribe for an ang angulated screw uh, option. Um, I just I basically will walk by and look and make sure that we get a confirmation that the, it's down and in place and it's seated. And then we get it back from the lab and we're putting it in and torquing it and, go, and going after it. But yeah, you, you can. That's a great workflow uh, and a great option. Cool. Hey, Dr. Shark, we actually have a question from Corey Porsche, which sounds like a really cool name for like a BMX biker or wow. something. X, <laughs> X Games for sure. How is Zephyr Shiresh related to AADSM? Uh, there's no real relationship. I've been a member of AADSM for 12 years. Uh, we work closely in terms of research and all that, but there is no commercial relationship or anything like that. A great organization if you want to learn about evidence and research from them and go to their annual meetings. As I said, I've uh, been going to the annual meetings for the past 12, 14 years, uh, every year. If you want to find me, I will be there, but that's pretty much as far as the relationship goes. We do follow the ADSM guidelines. Maybe that's what they were kind of referring to from that end. Uh, that's very, very important, and we do that quite closely. Gotcha. Got a couple of questions coming through on the Zephyr side, Dr. Shresh. I, can't, I don't know if you can see him, but I'll read them. Uh, yeah. With Zephyr, do you still refer to primary doctor or sleep specialist to confirm so you can make appliance or is the test appliance not regulated? No, absolutely. So we're not making a test appliance. I just want to clarify that as well. So the temporary trays that Doug was, uh, that Sam was showing there was basically for us to be able to predict whether or not a 
actually bespoke manufactured device is going to work for them or not. So we still use custom devices after making the prediction. Uh, the protocol is the same. You still need the physician to give you the diagnosis of a sleep apnea. As dentists, we cannot make diagnosis of a sleep apnea. So it's very important to work in an interdisciplinary model. When it comes to sleep medicine, key is going to be to having a team that helps you, similar to dentistry in general, not much difference. You need an ENT, you need a sleep physician. So short answer is yes, we get the diagnosis from the sleep physician and we'll go from there. Yeah, I think during our trainings here, we certainly train on the interaction and how to, how to leverage and build those relationships with those yeah. the sleep centers correctly. I do want to add to that because I wonder if there, there was a little layer to that question in terms of, well, you're still going to need a prescription from the sleep physician and maybe they're biased towards CPAP. And what we found for a lot of these patients are when we send that theranostic report to the physician along with the diagnosis, telling them, hey, we use the theranostic report. And based on that, the patient is going to be a responder. You're not getting as much resistance from the physician signing on the dotted line for oral appliance therapy. Because that's one of their biggest uh, challenges. Well, we, can, we have a device that is going to work all the time called CPAP, work all the time if they wear it. But we don't know if the appliance is going to work. And if you give them that answer, you're basically leaving them with no choice. Hey, we know it's going to work. It's evidence-based and you're good to go. Excellent. Thanks, Doc. Appreciate it. Uh, Thomas Tilson has a question on the computer speed. Notice it was a little slow. Is it running through a network or single computer in the room? Uh, it's a long story. <laughs> long story. That's on a network VPN to uh, another server. Yeah, um, so it had a, a touch of a lag. Um, thank you for pointing out my <laughs> faults and weaknesses. <laughs> but it's live. It's dentistry. You know, there's times where, where, where I love technology, where we're we're, we're stuck to it, and when it works, it's amazing, and there's always glitches. But yeah. uh, I, I would never practice any other way. And I think what you saw today is a product of the way we've got it set up here at the training facility and connected to our, our practice off-site. So much quicker than that usually in, uh, in your environment, I'm sure. So, um, all right. I think that's, that's it. We about we, it. We uh, really appreciate well, uh, Doug Fettig and Dr. Uh, Shiresh joining us um, and appreciate everybody logging on, sharing your evening with us. Final yeah. thoughts from uh, Dr. Bullwinkle? Final thoughts. You've got, um, guys, those of you who are thinking about going after uh, technology, taking this time to invest, invest in yourself. I know Doug Fettig talks about it. Um, I've talked about it uh, for years. When we start talking about how much it costs to go in through dental school to just understand how to do the basics of dentistry, uh, invest in yourself again. Spend that two, three, four hundred thousand dollars to change, dynamically change who you are as a dentist. Invest in your future. Invest in your patients. Um, I, as you saw Doug talk about it, I've had doctors that have come through and go, "Well, I was going to buy a cone beam, but my CPA told me I can't afford it." And, and it's just, you know, to me, it's just brain damage. You can't afford not to have it. You can't afford to give away and have patients go out of your office not giving them a correct diagnosis, being able to treat things properly, uh, and, and to be uh, the best provider you can absolutely possibly be. So, Sam, yeah. Sam yeah. I, have to, I have to interject real quick. If your CPA says it's not in the budget, you probably have the wrong CPA. Your CPA should be looking forward and saying, what is the return going to be? Not looking backwards in the budget. I, I, I had to throw that in. That's, I, and that's exactly it. You, you've got to look forward. Um, uh, as we come out of, as the rest of the country and, and we all come out of this COVID haze, let's look forward. What is it that we can do to our practices? Uh, what, how can we provide better care, keep our patients safer, keep our team safer, keep ourselves safer, be able to practice? Because I enjoy it. I plan on doing this for a long, long time to come. Um, and, uh, it, and with technology, I, I, it's, it's actually an option. And no better time, get with your Henry Schein uh, representatives. I believe they've got an amazing finance promotion yeah. right now. Makes me want to buy another one. I was going to say, you didn't get that. I didn't. I might, I might need to. Yeah. I think, what, what's the promotion now? Six it's, months, no payments, wow. followed by six months of $99 payments. Again, we have to check with Doug, but it's around 600 bucks for the year, if my math yeah. is correct, for the first year. <laughs> well, return before yeah. investment, and then uh, low finance rates uh, once your actual payments start. So, you know, no better way to leverage the power of, of low interest and, and cheap debt, like Doug mentioned uh, before, or inexpensive debt. Inexpensive debt, drive, drive revenue, increase your revenue. Add, add those, those uh, um, modalities and those revenue streams, those, those treatments that you're referring out. Keep them in your practice. Your patients will love you for it. It will change 
the way you, you see yourself and your patients. All right. Well, enjoy okay. dinner, everybody. If you haven't eaten, Love enjoy your with drinks us. if you're on the East Coast. And find us at 3dinfusiondental.com, and we'll see you next time. Right on. We're out. Thanks, guys. Go. All right. Well, a big thank you to you, Dr. Bullwinkle, for today's presentation. And, of course, thank you to our panelists for joining us as well. And thank you to all of our attendees for joining today and engaging with us and asking such great questions. We truly appreciate your time and participation. If anyone does have questions on the products discussed during today's session, please reach out to your Henry Schein rep and we'll be in touch with you soon. As I mentioned at the beginning, today's session was recorded, so everyone will be able to view the recording in the next week, so check your email for the link. Upon exiting the webinar, please complete the short two-minute survey and let us know what you thought of today's presentation. Both Henry Schein and Densply Serona are dedicated to providing additional online content for our customers during this time, so thank you again for attending, and please stay safe and have a great night.